I have to say, archaeologists like to insult me by calling me a pseudoscientist. I can't think of anything more pseudoscientific than the Clovis First Doctrine, which locked American archaeology for 50 years in a particular framework, which we now know was totally wrong. Nothing good about it at all. A, com a complete mistake. What I'm hoping the book will do uh, in the long run is that it will lead to more attention being focused on the Americas. This is a very neglected area of the world uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. I'm, it's, the recent history of the Americas has been relatively well studied, but the deep and ancient history has not been, has not been well studied. And I think America is going to contain revelations for us about our story and about our past. And I'm serious when I, when I suggest that America is the most plausible and the most likely home base for a lost civilization. Between Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx by Augustus Le Plogeon, MD, Art of the Sacred Mysteries among the Mayas and the Quiche, a sketch of the ancient inhabitants of Peru and their civilizations, etc., etc. A lot of books, all right? This is from 1896. And again, I just want to show a list of his uh, authors that he quotes or the sources he uses. A lot of famous historians, people of prim primary sources, like Jose Acosta, who one of the conquistadors that came, Confucius, even Blavatsky, even that philosophy, right? So a lot of things he uses, so I just want to say so you can verify his sources. He has footnotes throughout the book. All these uh, people, Marco Polo, Herodotus, and all these other people, historians. The Book of Joshua, all right? Book of Isaiah, Kingsborough, Lord Kingsborough. All right, all these people that he's quoting. I just wanted to show you. He has a lot of different sources. In chapter three, so it says here, continuing the examination of the cosmogonic diagrams of ancient historic Asiatic nations, we find next in importance the Emsov of the Chaldees. It can be seen at a glance that this also is an amplification of the Maya symbol of the universe as yet existing at Uxmal. All right, the symbol that they have in that book, it's a Mayan symbol that they, you can still find in the temple of Uxmal, as well as the Sri Santara of the Hindus. It's in Uxmal. It may be asked how came the Chaldees to adopt the same geometrical figures used by the Mayas to symbolize their cosmogonic conceptions. How did they come across with these Chaldees? Who are the Chaldees? Remember, Abraham, dad was a Chaldee. Are these an ancient people who came out of the Maya land or America? The Chaldee and the Chaldees. Where was really Chaldee? There is the whole book written about Chaldee being in Ireland. Ireland. All right, the ancient Chaldees. All right, how did these Chaldeans get all these symbols that the Mayas already have in their temples? Berosos, the Chaldean historian, tells us that civilization was brought to Mesopotamia by Oanis. All right, so the Chaldean history says that their founder was Oanis, all right, in Mesopotamia, Oanis, and six other beings, half man, half fish, so seven altogether, right, seven. So they're half man, half fish, who came from the Persian Gulf, in other words, by men who dwelt in boats, which is pr preciously the meaning of the vocable Oanis, or Hoana, in the Maya language, ha, water, ah, die, na, house, resident. He who has his residence on the water, Oanis, 
they who lived on the water or traveled on the ship, something that floated in the water, you can live in a ship. Is that what they mean by these fish people? He who has his residence on the water. Sir Henry Rawlinson, speaking of the advent of the early Chaldean in Mesopotamia, says, With this race originated the art of writing, the building of cities, the institution of religious system, the cultivation of all sciences and of astronomy in particular. Right. So these seven individuals brought all this knowledge over to so-called Mesopotamia. Right. And philology, like architecture, may serve as guide in following the footsteps of a people in its migrations on the face of the earth. Then we may safely affirm that the Mayas, at some epoch or other, traveling along the shores of the Indian Ocean, reached the mouth of the Indus and colonized Belo Chistan and the countries west of the river to Afghanistan. Right? Who colonized that? Mayas, they're letting you know. Where? To this day, Maya tribes live on the north banks of the Kabul River. You hear that? There's still Maya tribes there. The names of the majority of the cities and localities in that country are words having a natural meaning in the Maya language. They are in fact those of ancient cities and villages whose ruins cover the soil of Yucatan and of several still inhabited. I have made a careful compilation of the names of these cities and places in Asia which, with their meaning in the Maya language. In this work, my esteemed friend, the Reverend Dr. Don Crescent, Carillo and Ancona, the present bishop of Yucatan, has kindly helped me, as in many of other studies of Maya root and words now obsolete, the objects to which they applied having ceased or to exist or having fallen into disuse. Bishop Carillo is a literary gentleman of well-known ability, the author of an ancient history of Yucatan, a scholar well-versed in the language of his forefathers. He is of a Maya descent. Following the Mayas in their journeys westward along the seacoast, we next find traces of them at the head of the Persian Gulf, where they formed settlements in the marshy country at the mouth of the Euphrates, known to history under the name of Akkad. The meaning of that name given to the plains and marshy lands situated to the south of Babylonia has been until of late a puzzle to students of Assyriology. And it is still is an enigma to them why a country utterly devoid of mountains should have been called Akkad, all right? So he's letting you know, again, all these physical characteristics of these ancient places do not match today's uh, modern places. They say, you know, that these places were located at anciently and, you know, the land is different. And he's saying there's no mountains there. Why would it be called Akkad, all right? Have not... The well-known scholars, the late George Smith of Chaldean Genesis fame, Reverend Professor A.J. Saucy of Oxford in England, and Mr. Francois Lenormand in France, discovered by translating one of the bilingual lexicographical tablets found in the Royal Library of the Palace of King Usurbanipal in Nineveh, that in Akkadian language it meant mountain, high country, whilst the word for low country, plain, was summer and that by its singular antithesis the Sumerians inhabited the mountains to the eastward of Babylonia and the Akkadians the plains watered by the Tigris and the Euphrates and the marshes at the mouth of the river right with a question mark so now we get an etymology of these words right summer meant really a plain or you know like the lowlands that's what summer meant and Akkad Akkadia Akkad was mountainous mountain a high place that's for letting you know here, right? The way they try to explain such strange anomaly is by supposing that in very remote times, the Akkadi dwelt in the mountains and the Sumeri in the plains, the Sumeri in the plains, and that at some unknown, unrecorded period, and for some unknown reason, these nations must have migrated en masse, exchanging their abodes. <laughs> so they exchanged places, they're saying, but still preserving the names by which they were known, regardless of the fact that said names were at variant with the characters of the localities in which they now dwelt. But they did it both from custom and tradition. So they're saying that, oh, wait, where Acadia is today is lowlands, and what Sumerians is, they were a little higher. So it's the opposite of what the names mean. So it doesn't make sense. Shall we say, si no me vero ben trabato, although this may or may not be the case, there being no record that said permutation ever took place, and it therefore cannot be authenticated. 
the Maya, of which we find so many vestiges in the Akkadian language. All right, so many vestiges of the of Maya in the Akkadian languages. And for it's a most natural, dense, rational etymology of the name Akkad, and in perfect accordance with the characters of the country thus named. Akal is a Maya word. Akal, Akkad, the meaning of which is pond, marshy ground, and Akil is a marshy ground full of reeds and rushes, such as was and still is lower Mesopotamia and the localities near the mouth of the Euphrates. As to the name Summer, its etymology, although it is also very clear according to the Maya, seemed perplexing to the learned Mr. Lenormand, who nevertheless has interpreted it correctly. The low count country, right? The Akkadian root sum evidently corresponds to the Greek bottom, depression, and to the Mayan com, a valley, com. The Sumeri would then be inhabitants of the valleys, while the Akkadi would be those of the marshes. All right? From this and from what will directly appear, let it not be supposed that the ancient Akkadian and ancient Maya are cognate languages. All right? The great number of Maya words found in the Akkadian have been engrafted on it by the Maya colonists. All right? The Maya what? Colonists who in remote times established themselves in Akkad and became prominent after a long sojourn in the country under the name of Khaldi. Khaldi. All right? Though the efforts of such eminent scholars as Dr. Hinks, Sir Henry Rawlinson, Dr. Alpert Monsieur Grivel, Professor Saucy, and Mr. Francois Lenormand, and others, the old Akkadian tongue, or much of it, has been recovered by translating the tablets that composed King Asurbanipal's library. Mr. Lenormand has published an elementary grammar and vocabulary of it. From this, I call the few following words that are pure Maya. All right, so he's going to compare these Akkadian words with the Maya. All right, it goes to Le Plajon. It's going to show you with the same signification in both languages, and they mean the same thing. Having but a limited space to devote here to so interesting a subject, in my selection, I have confined myself to words so inequivocally similar that their identity cannot be questioned. All right, you cannot question it's the same word, same root from. The Maya, he got a table and he said, there's so many, though, it wouldn't fit in this book. It'd be its own book if I really was going to compare the Akkadian language with the ancient Maya language. Now, here's the table. Now, we start with Akkadian, it says ah, right, water. Maya, ha, ah, ha, right, same thing. Ah, it's also the Egyptian for water. Ah, ah, Maya, ha, 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 wa, ha, wa, right, the ha, ha, ah. Akkadian Abba, father, Maya Ba. And in most, uh, you know, Semitic languages, that's also father, right? Abba. Uh, like in Aramaic, it's Abba. Same thing. Father, Maya is Abba or Ba. Ba, Abba, Ba. Akkadian, Bala. Companion, also pal. Pal, a pal. Maya, pal. Companion, that's my pal. You see where we get that word? That's my pal right there. That's my companion. That's a Maya word we've been saying. It's not an English word. We've been saying a Maya word when we say pal. Pal. Right? And the Akkadian is also bala or pala. Pal. Bal. Akkadian pal means before. That which is in front. Get hand. And then Maya is kab. Pab. Kab. Hand. Arm. Branch of a tree. Kab. A particle that in composition indicates that the action of the verb takes place quickly. All right, it says Akkadian, ge, that which is below, maya, ke, radical or kemel, to descend softly without noise. Akkadian, ka, to complete, to finish. Maya, kanak, abundant, exceeding. Kak, fire, to burn, hence to destroy, to finish. Akkadian, kalama, the word, the countries. Maya, kala, the word, the universe. Akkadian, kas, to, Amaya, ka, tu. Akkadian, ke aku, inside of the earth, under. Maya, ke le, upside down, the inverse side. Akkadian, ki, the inhabitable earth. Maya, ki la, kabil, the nations, the ancestors. Akkadian, kul, the seed of animals. Maya, kul, the exact same thing. The seed, the rump, also to worship as in Assyrian. Akkadian, kun, the tail. Maya, kun, 
Mullers, Bundenda, I don't know what that means. Akkadian Kun, Daybreak, Maya King, Day, Sun, Kun, King. And we got some more right here. It says Akkadian Ku, Plai, or Place, Maya Ku, the place in safety. Akkadian Lao, sign of possession to take. Maya Lao, to take away, to empty. Same thing, right? Lao, Lao. Akkadian Ma, express the idea of loyalty or loyalty to the earth. Maya, Ma, the earth, the country. Ma is likewise Egyptian for country, place. Ma, place, the earth, Ma. All right. Akkadian Ta expresses the idea of an internal or external locative into from, from within as Tan, Ma, Ta, country. Maya is Ta, place, smooth and level ground. Tan, toward, in the center, before, near. Akkadian Ra, to bear toward. Maya, La, place, neighborhood, place where one stands. Akkadian, me, me, prefixes to verbs, nouns, or adjectives is the sign of negation. A Maya, ma, prefixes to verbs, nouns, or adjectives is the sign of negation. Are you almost the same? Ma, ulil, halna, don't wish to eat. It says Akkadian, men, or men, to be. Maya, n, I am. Akkadian, nana, mother. Maya, na, nana, mother, na, nana, na, na, mother, mother, right? The same thing almost. Akkadian, sar, white. Maya, sock, sar, sock, white. Akkadian, sun, sana, fons, or four, sorry. Maya, khan, four, sun, khan, four, also serpent, also serpent. All right, so that was a, a table, and it continues right here. Akkadian, sir, light, sassil, light, brilliance. All right, uh, Akkadian tab to place to add and Maya tab to tie to join to unite to add to unite to place tab tab Akkadian sha or shana fish Maya is kai kai fish Akkadian shas to cut Maya shock to cut with an axe all right so he compared a lot of good ones right there the moon and Akkadian is idu Maya is u all right and the moon purki another way pulkin sunstruck lit by the sun pulkin Turkey. Wow. It says modern Assyriologists, after translating the tablets on Assyrian and Chaldean magic written in the Akkadian language, agree with the prophetical books of scripture in the opinion that the Chaldees descended from the primitive Akkadians and that those people spoke a language differing from the Semitic tongues. A writer in the British and Foreign Review says Babylonia was inhabited at an early period by a race of people entirely different from the Semitic population known in historic times. These people had an abundant literature, and they were the inventors of a system of writing which was at first hieroglyphic. Of the people who invented this system of writing, very little is known with certainty, and even the name is a matter of doubt. All right, so that's a quote from that book, so they don't really know. According to Berosus, who was a Chaldean priest, these first inhabitants of Babylonia, whose early abode was in Chaldea, were foreigners of another race. They were foreigners. So are we talking about modern Chaldea today, what they say it is? Or, again, I got a book that is correlating a lot that's saying Ireland was Chaldea. The Chaldees were in Ireland. All right, well, we'll see, we'll see. Or was it in America? But I know that basically these people are being connected to Maya, so there's a connection to America. And then even what I was saying, that all these old world people, a lot of these are basically the, in the true old world in America, that well, that's the same connection I, I was talking about. Even if it was in Ireland, like they're saying right here, these people what were foreigners. So a lot of those people in Ireland actually arrived from America in ancient times and other places of Europe and Asia, but they were foreigners. They, that's even in their own local legends, right? He carefully established a, a distinction between them and the Assyrians. Those primitive Akkadians, those strangers in Mesopotamia, the Aborigines would naturally have regarded as guests in the country. Taking a hint from this idea, they called their first settlement Ula or Ul, a Maya word meaning guests newly arrived okay in this settlement in the marshy ground lest the natives of the wild beasts that swarmed in the reeds should attack them the strangers surrounded their dwellings with palisades and designated the place as kal ti whence kaldi 
by which their tribe continued to be known even when they became influential. The word Kalti is composed of two Maya primitives, Kal, to be enclosed with pose and Ti, place. In my work, The Monuments of Mayak and Their Historical Teachings, I have traced step by step the journey of the Maya colonists along the course of the Euphrates to the city of the sun. Babylon called in Akkadian, according to Mr. Lenormand, Kadingira or Tintir, the etymology of which appears to be unknown to him, though very easily found by means of the Maya. So a lot of these anthropologists don't know the meanings of these words or the beginnings or the origins, but Augustus keeps reminding everybody, if you look into the Maya phonetics of vocals, you can find the meaning and, and roots of these words. The name Kadingira seems to be composed of four Maya primitives, Ka, City, Ting, a particle which in composition indicates the place where one is or an action happens, King, a priest, La, eternal truth, the God, the Son, Ka Ting King La, or be it Ka Ding Gira, is the city where reside the priests of the Son. The name Ting Tir, Maya Ting Til, means Tin, the place where a thing actually exists, Tilis, by elision, Til, sacred, mysterious, venerable. Ting Til would therefore be the holy, the mysterious place, a very appropriate title for a sacred city. Til may again be the radical of Tilil, which means property. Tintil would in this case signify, this place is my property. It belongs to me, the God, the Son, which is in the perfect accordance with this other ethnic name of Babylon, Ka-Ra, or be it Ka-La, the city of eternal truth of the Son. The name given to the temple of the seven lights of heaven, as well as its mode of construction, shows that the builders were colonists from a country where that kind of edifice, the pyramid of stone, was not only common, but had so been from remote ages, all right? Letting you know, Babel is a word whose etymon has been a bone of contention for orientalists and philologists. They are not yet agreed as to its meaning. They don't know what Babel they're saying, these scholars, simply because they do not know to what language it belongs, nor whence came the people who raised the monument, who raised the Tower of Babel. Now remember, we're talking about Acadians, we're talking about now the Tower of Babel, what's in Canada, Acadia, what did uh, UB News or UBTV did a video on, the Tower of Babel being up there near Acadia, right? Babel, who really built it? Who were the Mayas? And were they really called Mayaks or Mayas at this remote time of history? All right, these are people from the Americas or these people on this side of the world, the true old world. All right, we're just surfing the wave here. We don't know what he's trying to say, but we're, gonna, we're surfing the wave. We are told they were strangers in the plains of Shana, in the plains of their strangers who built this thing, these strangers that came. Did they come originally from Mayak? Did they come from Mayak? They spoke the vernacular of that country far off beyond the sea toward the rising sun. And Genesis asserts that they had journeyed from the east. They had journeyed from the east. Flip the maps. Ba in Maya has various meanings. The principle, however, is father, ancestor, bell has also several significations. Among these, it stands for way or custom. Babel would therefore indicate that the sacred edifice was constructed according to the way, the custom of the builders, ancestors. All right, these are Maya word, Babel. Landa in his work, Las, Cas Las Cosas de Yucatan, informs us that the Mayas were very fond of giving nicknames to all persons prominent among them. The same fondness exists today among their descendants, who seldom speak of their superiors by their name, but a sobriquet descriptive of some marked characteristic observed by them and belonging to the individual. For instance, should anybody inquire concerning me, my proper name, of the men who for months accompanied me in my expeditions in the ruined cities of Yucatan, they certainly would shake their heads and answer, don't know him. But if asked about the Amexnal, he of the long beard, then they would at once understand who was meant. All right, so nicknames, we do that a lot in my country still. This same custom seems to have prevailed among the primitive Akkadians. Judging from the names of their first kings, the builders of the cities along the banks of the Euphrates, 
whose seals are stamped on the bricks used in the foundations of the edifices erected by them. Uruk, right? Uruk, we are told, is one of them. Lik Babi is another frequently met with. It is well known that no stones are to be found on the alluvial plains of Mesopotamia, that consequently the first cities were built of mud, all right? Mud, all right? They know there's no megalithic structures over there. All right, I've been trying to tell everybody that they don't have megalithic structures during the first years and their origins. It's all mud, mud. That is of sun-dried bricks, adobe. So we know that Tower of Bell is described to be built with mud bricks. Now, we know that Pyramid of Cholula, which has a very similar uh, story of the Tower of Bell, not saying it's the original because they, even there in their stories, they say it's a duplicate, an exact duplicate of the original Tower of Bell. And they did it with uh, sun-dried bricks as well, mud. The, the whole Pyramid of Cholula is, is a whole mountain that they thought it was a mountain, but it's an actual pyramid, very big. It's the largest uh, base of pyramid in the world, bigger, four times bigger than anything in Egypt, all right? The base of it. It is probably from that fact that they called the king who ordered them to be built Uruk, he who makes everything from mud. He who makes everything from mud, Uruk. Uruk is a word composed of two Maya primitives, hook, to make everything, and luk, mud. In composition, a hukluk would become contracted into huluk, hence Uruk. All right, you see how it breaks down eventually? This is also said to have been the name of the city of Erek, the seat of a famous Akkadian ecclesiastical college. This, however, does not alter the meaning of the Maya etymology of the word, nor make it less appropriate since the town was built of bricks dried in the sun of mud, consequently. As to the name of King Libabi, Likbabi, it is also composed of two Maya primitives, Lik, to transport and Bab, to roll. It is extremely probable that when constructing the temples in whose foundations his name has been found, as there were no roads for transporting easily by land his building materials, he made use of the most convenient waterway offered by the Euphrates, hence his sobriquet Lake Babi, he who transports all things by water, that is, by rowan. In the language of Akkad were preserved all the scientific treatises of the Babylonians, but from the time when the Semitic tribes established themselves in Assyria, in or about the 13th century BC, the Akkadian language began to fall into disuse. It was soon forgotten by the generality of the inhabitants. Its knowledge became the exclusive privilege of the priests, who were the depositaries of all learning. When the Semitic conquerors imposed their own dialect on the vanquished, the ancient tongue of Akkad remained, according to Sir Henry Rawlinson, the language of science and the East, as Latin was in the West during the Middle Ages. In the 7th century BC, Osurbanipal, king of Assyria, tried to revive it. All right, so remember who the Assyrians are. These are the people of Ashur, who is the son of Shem, right? He's a Semite. Assyria, Ashur, one of the sons of Shem. He ordered copies of the old treatises in the Akkadian language to be made and also an Assyrian translation to be placed beside the text. So they come with their Semitic or Hebraic language, right? And they, there was local people there already who were speaking the so-called Akkadian, what Augustus is saying, Mayan, really, this is old school ancient people, all right? Even before they were called Maya, it's not really Maya, but these are the same people that is for reference used. It is those copies that have reached our times, conveying to us the knowledge of this ancient form of speech that but few among the learned men of Babylon had preserved at the time of the fall of the Babylonian Empire, when Darius took possession of the city of Belus. We are informed by the book of Daniel that none of the king's wise men could read the fatidical words written by a spirit's hand on the wall of the banquet hall of King Belshazzar, only one Daniel the prophet, who was learned in all the lore of ancient Chaldeans. All right, Daniel, the son of King David. Yes, Daniel was the son of King David, who was in exiled in Babylon. Right. 
So only him could interpret them, it says. Dr. Isaac of New York and other learned rabbis assert that these words were Chaldaic, but they were in still our vocables pertaining to the American Maya language, having precisely the same meaning as given them by Daniel. The Maya words manel, manet, tek, upa, read in English, manel, thou art past in the sense of finish, mane, thou art bought or made, hence weighed, all things being bought and sold by weight, tech, light, not ponderous. The word is taken today in the sense of swift, agile. Upa, though will be broken in two. To that word are allied pa and paxal, to break in two, to break asunder, to scatter the inhabitants of a place. Is this a mere coincidence? By no means. There can be no doubt that the Akkadian or Chaldean tongue contain many Maya words. The limits of this work do not allow me to adduce all the proofs I could bring forward to fully establish their intimate relationship. A few more must suffice for the present. All right, so we're going to get into... Uh... This book now is called An Inquiry into the Origin of the Antiquities of America by John De La Field Jr. This is from 1839. All right. He gets quoted a lot in a lot of the people when they're doing their articles. We're in the introduction of this book. It says, Inquiry into the Origin of the Antiquities of America. Right. It says, We see in every direction around us the remains of unknown race of men throughout our country are tumuli. They mean like mounds and pyramids. Regularly constructed castra, embankments, and fossa. And many of these tumuli, curious articles and relics have been discovered, which have been buried with their possessors. Our object will be in the first place to trace, if possible, the descendants of the people which may have built these remains, for we have no reason to believe the race has become extinct. All right? They're not extinct. They're not extinct, right? You're still here, right? No evidence has at any time been adduced to prove it nor is is it probable all right so they you know how they say that these whole tribes be going extinct and these people this language that's all just talk there's no proof of that uh the extreme western limit of these vestiges of antiquity is not known it is believed and conceded that they are found as far north as the buffalo has been known to range i remember new let us know that you know you follow the buffalo could have been a way to go all the way down of mexico and peru and stuff you know or whatever you know migration patterns right based on what you know where the buffalo was going it says thence they extended to western north america and the isthmus of darien to peru all right so you hear that so extending to the west following the buffalo through the isthmus of darien meaning through central america that's panama the isthmus of darien to all the way to peru everywhere they defer in construction apparently to suit the nature of the ground All right, that's very important right there. Because you say, oh, well, the North American Indians didn't really have pyramids. Well, they didn't really need pyramids. They used the ground. They used whatever they needed. You know, so based on the nature of the ground, there was a lot of stone in Central America, and it was just better for earthquakes and all that. You got to think about all that. You know, so they had the ability to do it. The stone, they did it with stone. And up here, they did it differently. All right. In the southwestern United States, what did they use? The cliff dwellings and the mud houses and all that, right? In North America, they are principally built of earth. On approaching the elevated plains of the Cordilleras, we find the same remains, but serving merely as bases on which are erected massive stone edifices now in ruins. Given probably to agriculture are fertile prairies. Again, fertile prairies attracted the in unindivided attention of this people, save that which was necessary for protection from the mammoths, or from the hostile attacks of another race, and which resulted in the construction of earthen ramparts now remaining. All right, we saw how they built these fortifications, these high walls, these mound walls to protect the whole city that they lived in. But on proceeding southwardly, where they were probably no more molested by hostile invasion, their wanted industry found a new object for its exertion in the erection of the extensive cities of stone. This change of custom may also be easily accounted for in the beautiful language of a learned author who says that the faculties unfold themselves with more facility, whether man chained to a barren soil, compelled, compelled to struggle with the parsimony of nature, rises victorious from the Lenten contest. Deserting the fertile prairies of this land and encountering the more sterile plains of the volcanic mountains of Mexico and Peru, 
their energy directed its impulse to more lasting monuments of their existence as a people. All right. This author or this, you know, almost introduction is almost saying like they came out of here, right? Following the buffalo, heading all the way down to the western uh, United States, all the way down to Mexico, all the way through uh, Panama, the Isthmus, you know, uh, and reaching Peru, the Andes, the Incas, right? That's what this author is saying. It says here on the discovery of America, it is well known that the range of the Cordilleras in the mountains thence running south to the lower extrem extremity of Peru under the name of Andes, were the abodes of a high state of civilization, all right? The Incas, these, these, these places were, were civilized, right? And, and very populous. The residences of nations dwelling in cities, skillful in the texture of clothes, ingenious in the mechanical arts, and possessing no small acquaintance with astronomy and general science, while the rest of America was savage and benighted, they say right here, huh? without a ray of that intelligence which illumined the region just alluded to. That enlightened country comprehended several nations, differing in language and government, yet possessing such affinities as indicate conclusively as a common origin. Hmm. The most prominent tribes of this civilized family were the Aztecs or Mexica, the Toltecans, the Tlaxcalans inhabiting Mexico, the Muiscas who dwelt where now Colombia is, and the Peruvians. Continuous says no annals have been found proving a direct connection between Mexico and Peru, yet their language and manners and customs, very important, as well as their anatomical developments and equal advance in the progress of civilization, indicate a common origin. All right, Mexicans, the Mexicans in the Peru, Mochica, Mexica, you know, got Mochica in Peru, and then you got the Mexica people. All right. Tradition directly states, however, that their civilization emanated from the north. All right, they came still from the north, both of them, North America, right? What are we talking about? Utah, Aslan, Wisconsin, what are we talking about? Cali, Ohio, what are we talking about? Across the border.